How old do you have to be to be considered an elder? 60? 80? Maybe it's not a number. Maybe it's when you're one of the very few oldest members of your tribe, your clan, your community. Welcome to Calm in the Chaos, where elders are respected, revered, and honored. The month of May began with the news of how graves of hundreds of indigenous children were located in British Columbia, then in Saskatchewan, and on June 22nd, the United States Interior Secretary, Deb Haaland, began investigating the boarding schools in the United States that had required Native children to be taken from their homes, their families, their tribes, and were forced to learn the ways of the white people. Sadly, there were at least 25 of these schools in the United States, with more than 80 in Canada. Tragically, they were largely run by people who had a perfect example of how to live in love. People who professed to loving Jesus, white Christians. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter signed the Indian Child Welfare Act that permitted Native American parents to refuse sending their children to one of these schools. What does this have to do with elders? And what does this have to do with you and me? Elders are critical to a community. Elders carry wisdom. Every elder is a library of information to teach, a wealth of experience to share, and enormous strength of courage because getting old ain't for sissies, as actress Betty Davis told us. Elders are critical to a community. My first recollection of the word elder was in reference to Susquehannock, Shawnee and Iroquois families, tribes, and communities, people who once lived on the land I grew up on. The word elder felt like royal nomenclature to me, a title of honor, respect, a person held in highest esteem within their culture. The connotation of the word has changed a bit for me. I have since learned some formal definitions the adjective definition is a person of greater age than someone specified, as in respect your elders. As a noun, it can take on a different meaning. In some religions, Methodism, Roman Catholicism, for example, an elder is a person who's been ordained to fill the pulpit and to provide pastoral care to a congregation having nothing to do with age. In the Church of the Latter-day Saints, elders are always men, but both women and men can be installed as elders in many churches. Elders understand that protecting, guiding, and loving their community is paramount to the survival of that group of people. Grandmothers are sometimes elders. There was an ancient prophecy that said, when the grandmothers from the four directions speak, a new time is coming. Well, 17 years ago in 2004, 13 indigenous grandmothers from around the globe came together in the Catskill Mountains here in New York. They spent time in prayer together as they were all the keepers of traditions and spiritual training in their tribes. They were the elders. We learn from these particular elders that relying on the concept of all members of a tribe being of equal value, we can find peace. For instance, when a particularly good hunter brings back food, it is shared equally. He doesn't get a larger share just because of his skill. The grandmothers teach us that silence and solitude in nature 
can reveal spirit's finest gifts and lessons. The International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers have left us with this big lesson. All life is sacred and all life is one. And the grandmothers say, we will wake up from our trance now as the earth has begun shaking. Because common to indigenous peoples is an honoring and dependence upon the spiritual relationships that are accessed through nature. It's hard to not connect our recent global history of COVID with the earth shaking. I feel as though all of God's children have been shaken. How has the white Christian community violated the lesson that all life is sacred, that all life is one? Or did the Christians who created the boarding schools with intent to teach the indigenous children how to act and speak in white society, or the Christians who perpetuated enslaving other human beings when our African sisters and brothers were brought to the continent in the bowels of ships, the Christians who are still members of the Ku Klux Klan. Did those Christians miss the point that the Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers know to be truth about all life being connected and being one? In their wisdom and courage, in their truth and experience, they know how the world should be. And we know it too. If we can walk a mile in someone else's shoes to really feel what it's like to be in a marginalized community where decisions are made for you instead of by you, there might be a glimmer of hope. But we shouldn't have to do that. The lessons about loving one another as sisters and brothers have been presented to us in black and white print and in sermons and classes our whole lives. We should be listening to the elders, the writers of wisdom. In the Judaic Christian scriptures, Job 12.12 12 taught us of the value of being in the presence of older people. It says, wisdom belongs to the aged and understanding to the old. We should respect what elders have to teach us. In the book of Timothy, chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, it says, Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would to your own father. Talk to younger men as you would to your own brothers. Treat older women as you would your mother and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. Take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her. For all that we must value our elders, the wisest elders are those who value all of us, who stay in touch with all the members of the community, young and old, listening to one another, learning from one another, and valuing each member. When the dominant group of people learn of a condition that God wants us to address, there are choices of how to proceed. If we are in the dominant group on the issue of the indigenous children's graves, and that would be white people and mostly Christian-based, we usually feel safe when decisions are made. We do not know oppression and danger as people of color have lived and continue to live. It's our duty to look at history, to listen to the wisdom of people whose lives are long, and to make our decisions from a place of love. Jesus taught this. It's an abomination that people who identified as Christians caused some of the worst human atrocities on this continent, and now it's in our DNA. The suffering and pain is carried on in the generations since the children were murdered at those boarding schools. What do we do to respond to this news? Somehow, we must humble ourselves to attempt to understand the human terror 
that was caused. We must work to become the next wise elders in our tribes so we can repair the damage and not create more. We try to do this by listening to the council of 13 indigenous grandmothers. This whole planet is one home. The children on it are one human family. It's our responsibility to care for one another as family. That's what the book of Timothy said. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There's the golden rule. And then remember to go a step further to the platinum rule. Treat others the way they want to be treated, which may be different from what I want. What does the Lord require of us in this life? To act with justice, to be merciful, and to walk humbly. I believe the wisdom of the elders should be taken into consideration when new people are making decisions and trying to understand how the world works. With technology changing the world at warp speed, the ways of the ancients and elders may not be practical to put into place, but the wisdom underlying the practical applications needs to be heard. Honor the elders and may we all live to become true elders in our communities. Amen. Today we pray a prayer that was composed by L. Annie Forster in her book For Praying Out Loud. Let's pray. And as we pray together, picture all the people who share this prayer as they tune in. This is our tribe, our community. Spirit of ages, light of life, we gather today from many traditions and many ways of life to speak with one strong voice, to give thanks and to worship together. Let our prayer be heard, for aren't we all one family with the same wants and needs? Help us to strive for a healthy planet, to work toward peaceful, loving relationships with all of humankind, to achieve our vision of seeing all people fed in body and nourished in soul, sheltered from the rains and free from unnecessary fears. Let our thanks be heard, for aren't we all one family with the same joys and sorrows? Hear our praise of love and beauty. Accept our gratitude for the promise of children. Hearken to our songs of celebration, for music, for learning, for the solid earth beneath our feet and for the clear distant sky above, we offer thanks. Let our efforts be forever intertwined, for aren't we all one family, gathered here together grateful for the warmth and recognition we find in one another's hearts and faces. Thus we pray, and thus we offer thanks, and thus we love. So be it. Amen. Today's music is the background for a lesson from Good Buffalo Eagle. Hear these words from a Native American elder. 